All right, we're now recording. Welcome everyone to our weekly partners meeting uh, within the CCR in our system and uh, and partners associated with early learning. We've got our um, early learning division staff uh, representing various areas of the division here today to chat with you. We have uh, representatives from Central Coordination at uh, Teaching Research. PS, PSU's Oregon Career Center for Career Development uh, is here today. I see Pam waving her arm in some capacity. I'm not sure what that means, um, but I think she means she's happy to be here. Uh, inclusive. It's partners. my parade wave, John. It's my parade wave. Oh, okay. I thought parade waves were like this or something. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, um, you look like you're dancing. Uh, inclusive yeah, Partners, uh, they had a conflict, uh, so uh, Melinda won't be able to join us today. Um, I said that we were going to just actually reserve the entire agenda to chat about her. Um, she said we could sign her up for anything, so that's good. Um, do we have folks from DHS today? Yes, I see Regina's here. Good. And uh, 211 and Carrie. Good. I think we uh, have all of our partners represented. And uh, we have, as usual, a pretty reasonably packed agenda. And uh, one of the first thing we things we have on here is updates about uh, some staffing additions in our uh, community systems team. And so I'll turn it over to Joan to uh, give us an update there. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, hope everyone is doing well. Um, so uh, we've had the opportunity to bring on a few staff, um, of course, Leslie Barnes, who you've all met um, as the SPARC specialist. Um, some of these folks are not on the call today, but um, we'll have them come on a subsequent call. But just to let you know, if you um, start seeing people's names, that you can associate them with the work they're doing. So um, we. And in addition to Leslie's role as the SPARC specialist with the preschool development grant funds that we have, we're also able to bring on um, a, a position called the SPARC coordinator. Um, and that individual actually started today, um, her very first day at ELD. Her name is Lindsay Free. Um, we'll have her uh, hopefully on next week's call. You can have an opportunity to meet her. Um, her position is what's called a OPA one position. So uh, someone who really specializes in um, operations and systems and systems analysis. And um, she's um, has a great background, did some really great work with the city of An San Antonio, has done a lot of work with stakeholder engagement and outreach. And we think she's gonna be a great addition um, to work uh, as a partner with Leslie and to really help us as we move forward with um, uh, our SPARC revisions that'll start to be taking place hopefully um, between, you know, in the next uh, years, uh, coming years. So um, I know you'll be happy to meet uh, Lindsay when she's able to join us. Um, we also have had the opportunity to add um, an administrative support position for healthy families. Um, um, again, we'll have uh, Christina Cooley join a call so you can meet her. Um, she comes to us from the Salem Kaiser School District where she was working for the Director of Equity. Um, she's also run a Head Start, uh, she's been a Head Start site coordinator. So she brings a bit of an early childhood background um, and she will be mostly focusing on healthy families administrative support, but she also may be a name that you see sending you information. So again, her name is Christina Cooley. Um, and then finally, um, we have had the opportunity to bring on um, a hub specialist. Um, and we were very fortunate to hire Carmen Ellis, um, who many of you know, uh, worked with Christine um, at the CCRNR in Multnomah. And um, Carmen will be working predominantly with the hubs, but also will probably work with um, CCRNRs, um, and in particular, um, really supporting our work to bring a more, you know, robust training and technical assistance 
to both the early learning hub directors and CCR and our directors over the coming year. So um, we're very happy uh, to have these folks added to our staff and grateful for the um, mostly federal resources that allowed us to bring folks on, um, albeit some of them in limited duration positions. So John, do you want me to just start talking about the where things stand with the guidance? Should I just go right into that from here? Yeah, might as well uh, just keep the floor. Thanks, Joan. Okay, all right. Um, so all of you know, of course, the guidance was released um, and um, we have um, gotten a lot of different kinds of feedback, um, definitely gotten some positive feedback and of course gotten many, many questions. So. What we're really focused on now is supporting the successful implementation of the guidance. Um, so um, now starting to post on our website are short videos for each of the guidance sections. Um, right now there's an introductory video that's in both English and Spanish from Miriam that really talks about, you know, kind of like why this guidance, why now? Um, there's um, a variety of other videos that are there. Our intention is uh, to complete this week. The um, videos in English for all the sections and my understanding is that the Spanish language videos are being, were starting to be recorded yesterday. I believe we're going to be finished today. And then as soon as those can be quality checked, all of those will be up. So. I really feel like these are great resources for all of you to be linking and sharing folks to. Um, having watched many of them, worked on the script for one of them, I know that they're, um, you know, they're short, they're pretty conversational, they help people kind of connect to the why, they, all of the videos encourage watching both you know, Miriam, and then watching the overview video. So you, that's the same message in every single video. It says, start here, watch these two videos first, and then you can watch any of these other videos that is helpful to you. So that's sort of, I would think about that as one of the strands in our training and technical assistance plan, right? Is these videos, the fact that they're available 24 seven, people can watch them, they can watch them over and over again, anything that's helpful. Um, obviously, people can call their licensors. They can reach out, um, you know, with any questions that they have about the guidance um, and take that to their licensor. And I'm sure Tammy can talk more about, you know, how they're bringing in those internal questions and making sure that they're giving, con you know, working to give consistent answers to those questions. And of course, those questions that can come both through phone or through the provider email help us understand what people are struggling the most with, which then leads us to develop frequently asked questions. So in general, the frequently asked questions are questions that we get like they're thematic questions. We get a lot of questions about particular topics and those are the ones that we develop frequently asked questions for. So as we're pushing, um, as we understand what, it, what people are really struggling to understand, that helps us know what the frequently asked questions should cover. We're also uh, doing phone calls again, starting this week, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, the calls this week are set up in a very traditional webinar format. We're gonna have a small panel um, licensing staff, uh, Tammy's going to be leading those calls, except for the Saturday call that will include Miriam, um, which will be the Spanish language call. Um, and these calls are really, you know, put your question in the Q&A box, you know, we'll upvote, you know, participants will be able to upvote the questions and um, we'll discuss those with people, um, you know, but everyone will be muted. So I would call these very traditional webinar. And again, remember, also the videos are available. Also, you can call your licensor. We really want people to understand that this is a package. You know, these calls aren't intended to answer all of people's questions. They provide a certain kind of answer. But if people have a very personal issue about their specific site, it would be really helpful for them to call their licensor so that they can discuss that very specific issue or issues with them. Um, then the phone calls that are going to be happening next week are 
by registration. Those are gonna be much smaller groups. That'll be more conversational. So if people really want a chance to ask questions with a small group of other providers, so think in the neighborhood of about 15 people in a small group with a facilitator and kind of a recorder assistant, that's how those calls are set up. So, you know, if you're working with folks who really would benefit from you know, being a part of a group conversation, you could see how that could be really helpful for them, then you might want to encourage them um, to be a part of those calls. Um, and then we will be looking ahead to make a determination about what other uh, calls might we need um, to do in the following weeks. We're also working on um, a variety of products associated with the guidance, like for example, the health and safety plan template. We have a first draft completed of that. We're getting feedback today. We expect to finish our second draft of that this week, and then that will ha head into the finalization, um, formatting, translation process. Um, and our goal is to release that in very early September. Um, we're also working on um, guidelines at a glance for parents. So how do we take the information that's in the guidelines and create a very, very family friendly, um, small, um, very simple way for families to kind of understand like, what should I expect when I'm going into childcare now? What, I, what, what should I be looking for? What's expected of me? You know, for example, if your child is kindergarten age or above, they'll need to have a mask when they're going into, you know, when, if they're in kindergarten and they're in childcare, they're gonna need to have a mask on when they're there. So you're gonna need to bring a mask with your child. You know, we wanna give some, what I would call anticipatory guidance so that they can understand, you know, the situation. Um, there's not a lot of states that have reduced this kind of information. Probably the best example we've seen so far is Massachusetts. Um, but really we want something that, that will be useful to families. And of course, we'll be um, talking to many of you about how we can make sure that that, that gets distributed um, and made available to families so they can um, use that to help them understand their situations. Um, Tammy and a, a team of other folks from across the ELD are working on a variety of resources for uh, childcare providers. Um, we're trying to really anticipate what people will need, what will be helpful to them. Um, I would say um, all of ELD is really engaged in supporting this implementation. Um, it's been just such a great time, for example, for Leslie Barnes to come on board because she's been able to really bring such a great perspective as a longtime childcare business owner in helping us to work on this health and safety plan template um, and, and other documents as well. So many things are underway um, and the goal is really to get as much of this um, done as possible along with what we hope is going to be more robust training um, and some other follow along technical assistance opportunities that will be happening um, you know, in the months of September, October, and going forward from there. Jerry had her hand raised. Um, so I had a question about the small conversations. So what I heard was people and a facilitator, but what's the outcome? I mean, who should call into that? Um, because um, are, are those people who are gonna have specific questions? Um, and who would be answering those questions? Okay, so it's gonna be licensing staff who will answer questions. Great. Um, I think that they really are going to be most relevant for people who have questions and who would appreciate being with other providers in asking those questions and hearing the answers to other providers' questions. Like that's not really gonna work for everyone. So that's why I was trying to be a little bit descriptive, Jerry, if you all were trying to describe the differences to people, you know, yeah, it's I, like. Yeah, having the, having it with a licensor, I think that's the key part. And that's, yeah. I think that's great. Yep, actually, I think it's gonna be actually two licensors or a regional manager and a licensor. So um, Tammy can give more specifics if people want 
you know, more on that. But the goal is that the people that are facilitating those calls are, are of course, they've had training. Tammy did the training. They've been working with the guidelines. There may still be some questions they can't answer that they may still need to circle back on, but the goal is that it's a satisfying experience for people in a small group setting that's more of a conversation. So you can ask a follow-up question if the first answer wasn't clear to you. That's a little harder to do in the traditional webinar format. Great, thank you. And I will say that Tammy was also reminding me that we have the Russian language call, which is exciting and um, fantastic and really um, came out of the licensing staff, the idea to do the call, they self-organized, they brought forth the idea. So we're thrilled with that, that's happening as well. Are there other questions related to the current uh, child care guidance, the calls, anything that Joan was reviewing. I'm not seeing additional hands raising at the moment. Um, thank you, Joan, for the, the overview on, on that. All right, so in our uh, updates, and I noticed, uh, so I'll just, mentioned that uh, Jessica is doing what she does, well, not just what she does best, she does everything really good, but uh, she makes sure that we have all the links right at our fingertips, and so that is perfect. Uh, she has added um, everything from uh, the resources around um, the videos to the presentation uh, dates and times uh, that are links on to uh, our database, or not our database, our website. Or something there's all, all sorts of technology all the time okay so thanks Jessica and uh, the next agenda item uh, relates to um, essentially child care and and uh, and sort of the the processes that are uh, our child care providers and folks that are interested in becoming child care providers are going through at the moment and I know that in your communities you guys are working on many things related to um, assisting folks to understand uh, what the process is like right now and, and what they can expect. And I think what we've had uh, queued up here and we're was hoping Tammy might be able to um, give us a little bit of additional information on is um, uh, related to the timelines that uh, child care providers are um, can, can expect as they're moving forward to try and become registered to certified, uh, et cetera. So just, uh, Tammy, uh, I'll turn it over to you. And I think there might be a few specific questions that folks have we've been talking about it over a series of weeks. Anyone who isn't muted, um, please take a moment to mute yourself unless I can do it for you, which I just did. So Tammy, go ahead. Great, so um, so new provider timeline. You know, during there was a few months there when we weren't doing new providers, when we weren't doing those inspections. We have started doing those again. Um, throughout the state, um, we're doing kind of a hybrid model where we're doing as much as we can over the phone. And then the in-person portion is very quick, down and dirty, go in, see what you need to see and get back out. Um, there are some areas or some offices that um, maybe are not implementing the hybrid model because we don't have any staff that are um, comfortable enough going out and doing field visits. So with those cases, we are just doing opening new facilities um, completely virtually. So it just kind of depends on the office. Also, we had quite a backlog, as you can imagine, from a couple months of not doing them. So I know, um, like, for example, in Tualatin, where we maybe have two or three staff comfortable going out and doing an in-person visit, but we had a backlog of 20 applications. We're getting those processed through with just doing them um, virtually if we don't have enough staff to go do the hybrid. So what I understand is the backlog of new applications are getting run through pretty quickly. Um, in terms of like a registered family going to certified family, we're open available and getting those running on our end. I'm not hearing of any backlog or backup on our end. 
you know, we're with the certified family, you are dependent on the environmental health specialist. So that could be where there could be some delays happening. Um, and I know with like certified centers, you know, I received an email about why it's taking so long. And when I did some research into it, what we found is that the provider wasn't able to get sign off at the city for zoning and planning. So our staff are ready, available and working through them um, just like always with normal timelines. Sometimes the holdup could be fire, marshal, sanitation or local city and, and planning if they don't have their offices open and they haven't got a system set up to support those going through. So from everything that I've heard from the licensing specialist angle, we're getting them through and we don't have a backlog and everybody's getting what they need. Um, if you have anything specific in a certain part of the state where you're hearing something different, you absolutely can shoot me an email so I can do some additional digging. Um, but what would be your best source is to go to that regional manager for that office because they have daily contact with their staff and they're gonna be more familiar. Um, so you can always go through me um, or preferred is to start at the regional manager and see if they can get it cleared up why there seems to be a delay. But from what I understand from our end, we don't have any delays or backups and we're running them through um, just like always when inspections are completed that are needed. And John, you said there might be a specific question. Well, I, uh, I thought there could possibly be some folks that were hearing um, that, that there were some delays, but uh, Karen Hinkemeyer might have a question. Uh, and then it, I can't recall what region was bringing forward. A, there was a specific concern around a, um, someone saying it might take up to six months to get uh, through the process of becoming registered. So that, that may have been an isolated incident and something like you said that we can work with um, regional managers to discuss. But Karen, uh, what was your comment or question? One, um, Alicia has been really great for our regional area and very supportive. One other thing that I'd really like to see if we can uh, have information about is regulated subsidy non relative care. Um, if you can talk about the timeline for visits for them to yeah. be processed. Absolutely. So nothing really has changed with regulated subsidy. Back when COVID first hit, we immediately implemented doing those visits virtually because we recognized that we needed to get those providers up and being paid. Um, so we really never had a delay on those. Where that delay almost, you know, 100% of the time occurs is that we're reaching out to that regulated subsidy provider and they're either not responding or they're not ready. And so sometimes those do take weeks, if not a couple months, but it's not on our end. It's because a lot of times we're contacting them and they're just not even responding to the uh, messages that we're leaving. And after three attempts, we send it back to DHS and say, you know, they're not responding. So um, specific ones, again, I would go to the regional manager because they can look it up and see what contacts we uh, made and see if, you know, what the hold it may be. But um, and I know in Portland area, you know, I know we get a ton of those up there. And so I think reaching out to Catherine Miller or Abby Strom, if you're hearing that those are backed up a little bit so they can get some support for their staff. But most of the time it's because they're not responding to our calls. I appreciate that. Um, with the school age crisis coming up and, and parents wanting to do pods, um, we're really wanting to make sure that families that cannot afford child care and are supported by ERDC have adequate supports and license exempt non-relatives. So I just wanted to make sure that we had um, that still on our radar. Yep, absolutely. And Karen, again, like I said, if you hear of any backup happening, reach out to Catherine and Abby in Portland or Alicia in Gresham, and they can do some problem solving on that. All right, other uh, questions related to this, Jerry and then Eva. Um, so um, Tammy, we have um, a lot of community partners coming together to try to figure out how to stand up um, additional care. And um, we're, I'm wondering whether you feel it's appropriate to have um, a licensor on, the call, on these calls 
because so many of the questions are really licensing questions, and as a CCRNR, we just don't feel like that's um, appropriate um, for us to be doing things that are, I mean, we can't, that's not our wheelhouse. Um, so, um, yeah. So, so, so help Denise, me. Denise Swanson actually just reached out to me this morning specifically about Lynn Benton Lincoln saying there were some meetings happening and who should I get connected. And so absolutely Ellie Katara or one of the licensors should be on those calls. And so I directed Denise and copied Ellie in so that she could get connected and, went, and be a representative. Totally agree. We, if you need somebody on them, we can get somebody on them. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Definitely. Um, before Eva jumps in, I, I will say, Tammy, uh, we might want to chat just a little bit because I think region by region, there's been some um, region by region, there's been regional manager um, uh, differences in their ability to get to some of these meetings based on their workload or or perceived um, uh, you know, need, I guess, as to whether or not they should be on some of those community conversation calls. But I do, I, what I've really heard from our CCR and our uh, partners around the state is that when a regional manager or licensor is engaged in some of these community conversations, it really enhances the uh, community partner's ability to understand where their parameters are. And so the more that we can do to get those folks um, engaged, the better. I think the calls for providers are great. And I think that CCRNRs can utilize what they hear on the webinars and reinforce that in communities. Uh, but I also think that those very specific questions that come out, um, you know, just uh, sorry to say, I think that uh, the the wonderful stuff that's been happening in Karen Hinkemeyer's region with uh, um, uh, her licensing partnerships have set a bar <laughs> <laughs> that everybody's wanting some uh, engagement that way, um, and and I think it helps people realize where. And I and I think we we have on the agenda to talk a little bit about some further guidance around pods and and things of that nature. But I I think in the meantime, um, it's it's been quite quite a beneficial uh, tag team partnership in in regions. So. Um, Anyway, if you, yeah. if you can reinforce, that would be great. And then I'm sure CCRNRs will connect with their contacts locally. Um, yeah, so I just drafted an email that's uh, ready to hit send that said, please, it's going to say, please prioritize these. And if you can't assign a staff to prioritize and go to these meetings. So I apologize if um, you've had a hard time connecting with someone. Certainly we're all busy, but these are important and critical things. I totally agree. Sweet. Love it. Um, and uh, Eva, you had a comment, question? Yeah, I, it may be more of a comment than a question. Um, I've got a um, program that's been looking to serve uh, school age children, and we were looking to get them uh, licensed. And the response they received from licensing was that there was no way that that program was going to be licensed before school started, and that they should use the 70 day exemption. And if they weren't licensed uh, by January, they could access a second 70 day exemption. And I'm just, um, I think really concerned about the message that may be going out um, when we talk about um, licensing being foundational health and safety, um, that, that we've got programs that are potentially opening um, and, and finding ways around um, meeting some of those requirements. So I, I think it's, it's maybe a comment um, and then also really wanting to understand then um, because I, I think that they're all supposed to become ECC uh, uh, yeah. that's the right word except <laughs> um, so you know I, I'm, I'm concerned about messaging um, around the backlog and ways around it and and how people are meeting the, the ECC guidance. Yeah, Eva, I really appreciate that. And we're really struggling too with that message because the truth is, is that the 70 days is in statute. And so while we don't really want people using that, um, we're really struggling with that too. And I know we're working on messaging that would be in the form of like a press release um, because it's really hard to dance around something, especially if programs know about it. Like, 
we don't, I mean, we, you know, I can't guarantee what 60 people statewide are doing, but in general, we don't say, hey, did you know there's this 70 day loophole? Um, you know, but it's in statute. So if somebody, which people really have studied our statutes through all this, if they ask us about it, it it's a challenge to, um, but I totally agree. And if there's, you know, a specific program I need to look into to see why we're thinking we can't get them going sooner, I'd be happy to do that. If you shot me an email, I'd look into it. But I really do appreciate that because we have been dancing around that 70 days and it's really tricky. I and appreciate that, Tammy. Thank you. That in January and that's the unfortunate language of how the statute is written. So it's been a very hard dance. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I see uh, Mary Wolf has a question, comment. Um, could you describe that 70 day issue a bit more, Tammy? What, um, what statute says is that if people are not ordinarily engaged in the business of childcare, they can operate for 70 days without being licensed. And that exemption also means that they don't have to be ECC because exempt programs don't have to be ECC. Now, the tricky part of that is what does it mean to be ordinarily engaged in the business of childcare? When that was written many, many, many years ago, I mean, I think even before I came around, um, the idea was that if you're like, for example, a school teacher or you work in a school program and during the summer you're not employed, during those summer months you could use that 70 days. It wasn't intended for a pandemic when we're trying to piece together options. And so then we would have to look at, well, is this program ordinarily engaged? And if they are, then they can't use that 70 day exemption. And what we told our licensors is in, the, in that case, the only way somebody can use that exemption is that they are absolutely declaring an end date and saying, I'm only doing care until November 1st when children are supposedly going back into school and they're declaring an end date and it's for a finite period. It's not meant as an on ramp to um, continuing to do care. And so I wonder too if that message has gotten a little bit um, watered down. And so that's good for me to know that I need to reinforce that. Thanks, that's really helpful. Yeah, I'm making myself another note to provide a little clearer language for our staff. All right, so I'll let you make your note and talk really slowly before I let Heather ask her question. Go yeah, ahead, I, Heather, yeah. and feel free to speak. Uh, so I just wanna clarify, if somebody is using that 70-day rule, who are they declaring this to? You know, it's just that we know about it, they are, it's just a conversation, but there is not, like I said, this statute was never written for, written for a pandemic. So mm -hmm. it's, again, something that we are just dancing around at night. And if you're getting those questions, just send them our way. And, you know, we're doing the best we can. And, you know, what I told our staff is you're doing the best you can with the information that you have today and we might get something wrong and we might be able to fix what we got wrong and we might not be able to, but we're doing the best, you know, that we can to be consistent. So send the questions to us rather than you guys trying to feel like you're stuck with them. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. All right, are there any other uh, questions related to this topic around licensing? around uh, helping programs ensure that they're um, getting through that process. Um, I, and I don't know how you feel about this, Tammy, just making a general comment about the, um, the guidance that is coming or that's on the way, because I feel like it all kind of ties in and fits with this, and then we won't have to go to that agenda item a little bit later. Um, and revisit it, um, it'll allow you to either um, be done with all of our uh, line of questioning or, or move on to other appointments and things that you have. But um, uh, do, you, do you have thoughts about uh, uh, how to intro that or do you want me to just bubble uh, through it and you um, provide some additional support after that? How to answer the, the topic, the that is on for later for the regional discussions. Is that, did I, am I following you? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I was. So we have uh, on our agenda a little bit further down the line, regional discussions regarding reopening child care. But um, uh, I'm not sure that we can get deep into that particular discussion as much as just being able to give everyone some uh, additional information, which is related to the fact that uh, um, our leadership at the division has really been, um, and this is, I'm not telling this to Tammy, but she can reinforce the message on what she knows. But our, our leadership has really been focused on um, uh, things that they're hearing from the field, I think, in, in various regions. And uh, CCRNRs have been doing work in, uh, in their communities and had um, school districts that are well-intentioned uh, and, and other partners, uh, county partners, grassroots efforts, really everyone trying to figure out uh, what the options are for ensuring that school-aged children aren't falling through the cracks in the fall. Um, but uh, with the guidance that, uh, with the information that's been coming from you all at CCRNRs um, and um, work that's been being done at uh, our leadership level, there is um, some upcoming information that will be released very soon and um, some some additional guidance, a flow chart to help with some of these things. I believe that there will be some information about um, uh, how we're viewing our community partners such as you guys uh, supporting and interacting with these parent pods and some of the messaging that we need to do around um, any pop-up care that might uh, be being tried to be established in your communities. And so I think there's a lot more to come around this, but there is going to be um, something coming in the form of a an information release and some guidance from, from the division around how we are going to interact um, in communities around these ongoing topics because school's coming quite soon. And so I, I do see that Joan came back on and Tammy, if either of you wanna um, add additional information to that, uh, intro, feel free. Joan, do you have anything to add? Uh, the only thing I was going to add, and I'm not sure how much value it is, is that um, I do believe there is going to be some kind of a decision making flow chart, you know, that kind of should give people more guidance about whether or not what they're intending to do requires them to be licensed to actually carry out those activities. Um, and, um, I know we, I believe we're working on a final draft of that, um, at this point in time, um, hopefully that's going to be out in the next day or so. My understanding is there will be a press release associated with that as well, because it is a, as we know, a very, um, a topic of high interest. Um, we hope that this will be helpful to you and your regional partners. Um, I don't know, Tammy, if you know anything more than that, but that's what I understand at this point. Yeah, I mean, yesterday we thought we had it done and then we realized that maybe the language wasn't as um, outside of OCC friendly as it could be because when you have Tammy Scott reviewing it and it's been my world for 20 years, I don't necessarily see it the same way that an outside parent would. So I think some of the language is being um, uh, cleaned up a little bit to support the understanding and you know in terms of of programs that you're hearing whether they be pop-ups or parent pods send them to us you know and we'll we'll field those questions so that you're not in that position if you know of pop-ups that are happening and you think gosh that seems like it should have licensing involved send them to us and we'll reach out to those programs um, and do that side of the work because um, we, I do know that communities, like John said, are trying to do everything they can to support um, their community, and sometimes those things aren't legal, and so send them to us, and we would be happy to have those conversations and play that role with them, and um, I do agree with Joan that I know we're working on getting something out um, specifically around the parent pods. So felt like that kind of coincided with what we were chatting about at the time. Are there any additional questions, um, comments, needs from all of you? 
And John, I did put my email in the chat box just in case anybody, and Eva, I'd love to hear from you about that program and see if we can problem solve that a little bit more too, um, if anybody needs to reach out to me. Yes, thank you very much for that, Tammy. I, you are um, extremely busy and yet extremely responsive um, in many of these issues and have helped out in uh, various ways with even questions we have within our own division to help the CCRNRs uh, and to answer appropriately to the field. So uh, thanks for offering up your email on top of all that. Yes, Christine. Absolutely. Oh, you're, it says you're on mute, but we don't hear you. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yep, that works. Um, I wanted to also thank Tammy and all of licensing because um, we've had some really great partnerships and that's been going really well. Uh, my question is about the parenting pieces coming out. Will that be in the form of like a public service announcement? I'm curious how that's going to actually get out to parents because I feel like our contact is pretty limited with parents. Right. And that's really, Joan can talk to this too. That was what we were thinking because if our target audience is parents, then putting it on our website is not going to do any good or giving it to you is not going to do any good. So I believe a public service announcement was the idea or a press okay. I think it's it's a press release and then I think for like for example the guideline guidelines at a glance that I was talking about for families will be working through partners like 211 and the early learning hubs and OPEC and DHS and OHA and like really trying to push out as far as we can culturally specific organizations people that won grants in the equity fund like really trying to do a blanket um, understanding that you all don't necessarily have the um, you know primary contact with families though of course we would want your support in the distribution of that as well okay thank you I know the schools are really looking for those types of resources and that's where I would be our biggest connection but I just was curious where else that would go okay yeah thank you yeah Thanks, Christine. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, uh, thanks all for um, the feedback. Uh, and also, Tammy, again, uh, thank you very much for joining these calls each week. Uh, it's been extremely helpful for, for our partners. And uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, just trying to read the chat box, Cass. You're just throwing me, for, throwing me for a loop. Got, got to read that too. Um, and uh, so let's see. So moving on in our agenda here, we're still in our updates section, and we have Ronnie uh, listed today to uh, give us a little bit of an update on introduction to re registered family part two. We've had. Um, uh, a few of our CCRNRs reaching out, uh, seeking some of the documents in um, electronic form because you guys have all been able to order the documents in the past uh, through our process to get the physical copies. But now, as we're moving into virtual um, uh, conducting of the IRF Part 2, um, it's helpful to have those materials at your fingertips in, in other ways. And so Ronnie uh, has been helping me out. Um, because I think everybody was asking me and I was fumbling around to find the resources and Ronnie said, let me take that for you because you're slow and you're, uh, you're messing up the process. So, um, and she, that way. she said it much kinder, but go ahead, Ronnie, what, what's your update so far? Well, the update is, boy, you're really good at reading my mind. <laughs> So, um, okay, so with the help of Sydney, and I gotta tell you, I love that Sydney, she gets things done. Um, we have uploaded um, the participant packets and the licensing packets in that um, TRI folder for the CCRNR group that uh, you typically go to to find documents. Um, the ones that you will find us in are the CCRNR material group. And um, so you'll find the packets there. Um, instead of putting the guidance there, we just added a link to it. And after 
conversations with multiple uh, licensing specialists, we were really worried about what this uh, cohort of new RF providers coming in this time will look like and how they will operate after um, COVID because they'll be, they're learning what the new rules are and they're learning also COVID rules and how that might be confusing as to what's the rule if that went away, you know, just a lot of confusion. So the decision was made that the licensing specialist will continue to do the, um, the earth part of their process as always. Uh, we're going to give you one new slide to add in there so that they will know that once they send in their registered family application and that application is assigned to a licensing specialist, that the licensing specialist will then give them the ECC application after going over all the COVID rules, the, the health and safety guidance with them. And um, so then that way they'll know that these are additional and these are different. They're, um, these are the guidance that you need to follow now. And then they'll give them the ECC application for them to get on through their process. Um, anything else? Not, John, I guess your job is done. Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands raised here. Um, I do see uh, Jessica asking if you'll send that slide. Yes, yes, of course. And uh, we'll also add that into the um, into that uh, CCR and our material section. We also need to um, we also need to work on the translations of that, but it's it's small. So hopefully we can get that done fairly quickly. Shannon? So just because I'm this way, can I repeat to you so I understand? So um, the licensor will, in the part two, do the regular rules just in their discussion on their packet. After the provider sends in their application and gets assigned a licensor, the licensor will talk to them about the guidance and give them the ECC approval application. Yes. That, that was right? Yes. Woot. Okay. Yes, that was right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So don't, so what you're saying is to don't add the guidance into the packet, leave it out. Tammy's shaking her head, yes. And we did give you the link. I also wanted to caution you about this one other thing. The Office of Child Care has always had a very close handle on the family child care. And uh, sending it out electronically, uh, we kind of talked this out a little bit because uh, if you send it electronically to a registered family child care provider, we really don't want that registered family child care provider to send it to her friend and say, oh, here, all you need to do is fill out this application. And so we to send it out electronically is not something we've done. We I also learned this morning that there were some plans to update it, to, to update a, a, some parts of it. So even if you're holding on to this, electronic application in the future after COVID, it may not be the valid one to use. So uh, we really would just like you to not use that, not share it, what have you, after COVID is over and after we get all through this. And in that way, um, when these arrive at the office, we'll know how they got there and that they that they're in the process. It just cut down on the confusion and um, for individuals kind of going through the process. Does that make sense? Yeah, Ronnie, can I jump in real quick? I, you, you mentioned that I was nodding my head in agreement with you about not attaching the, the COVID guidelines. I was nodding my head because I thought that was what I understood from you and the group that you met with, that that was the recommendation. Well, we had given, we put the guidelines into their packet. Um, we haven't, um, yeah, the, the license, the CCRNRs have access to the, to the link to the guidance in there. They can present it out um, after the overview as well. 
whichever way, because the licensing specialist will review that with them. Okay, so I misunderstood. So Shannon, you guys can provide the guidance. It's just not going to be reviewed during the overview, and then the Ellis will really go through it with them. <laughs> All right, any other uh, comments, questions? Karen Hinkemeyer? Oh, and then Mary. So I put mine in, in the chat. I'm, I'm just wondering, so once that ECC application is filled out, does it then go to try to enter as an ECC or does that information go to 211 um, to enter the shell and then at CCRR pending? I don't know the answer to that question. Tammy, do you? Well, I mean, when the ECC is entered by the licensor, that Chris talks to 211 and Hannah might have more information on that. I know that it, it happens somehow, um, but I'm certainly not the data person that follows that, but I believe it talks from Chris to, um, to Wu, who then organizes all, which was a really bad answer. Um, and somebody else on the line that's more involved in that process. This is Hannah. Um, I don't think here we get it from um, there. Um, enter it usually first because Chris sometimes take a while, so we would enter it as a CCR in our pending base off the ECC. Um, because sometimes what we're noticing is Chris is lagging from the ECC um, on a data side. Um, so yes, we are entering them if we do not have them in Chris or they're still pending in Chris or something. If we have them as ECC, then they go to CCR and are pending. Because we're seeing a lot of programs come through that are not quite through Chris yet through ECC, even with updating as well. All right. Thanks for that uh, explanation, Hannah. And then uh, Mary, did you have a question? Um, I just wanted to be sure about the um, licensors' um, participation in the ERF. If they're not able to be there or something comes up and they're not, is the expectation that they will then directly contact the, um, you know, the provider that wants that training and follow up with them? Sorry, could you say that again? Well, we scheduled some of the ERFs and then um, the licensor will not be able to attend for some reason. So, um, you know, we'll do our part, but mm -hmm. the licensor won't be there. So how how is that going to be completed? Are they so, expected then to directly contact them and just do it one-on-one? -on -one if there's so only I would there? expect that we have a licensor at all of them. So if you're having a hard time with the licensors not being available, contact the regional manager um, and because I, I would be expecting they would be there. All right, thanks. Okay, thanks, Mary. All right, uh, any other questions uh, related to the IRF? Uh, one one question from me, uh, when I click on the TRI link, because I don't have uh, access yet to those files, I get an oops page. Um, is uh, What's the process for people to go through if they get the oops page, Hannah? Uh, if there is an oops page, there's a request for a login, um, but I'll, I will look and see. I can send out a, I have a document of how you can set up your account. I'm sure I'm one of very few. All the other folks on this call probably have their access and can can get to the files, but um, I will take a peek. Just in case, if I learn how, then I can coach somebody at a, at a later date. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, let's see. So Mary was asking if uh, Hannah might be able to attach the documents. Um, I'm assuming you mean from the from the links page in the CCR and our materials. And 
And so um, that may be possible. Uh, I would also, though, want people to make sure that they're always going to the uh, landing page so they can get the most up to date files in case we change them out. But uh, um, I'll let Hannah decide whether or not she can make those uh, accessible through our chat box here. With all the languages, I'm not going to be able to put them all through the chat box of individual links to the documents. Um, but I will, because there are 10 different folders with languages and participant packets. And then there's multiple, yeah, there were multiple folders. We didn't feel like we could successfully email them to you. So that way, by putting it in that one holding spot that you were used to going to, we can do that. John Toby has a question. All right, go ahead, Toby. Um, my question is, you said that there was going to be the one slide added. Or is it going to be just the slide, or are you going to put it into the, the PowerPoint itself, where we could just pull the PowerPoint from the TRI um, website? Um, I don't think we had put the, the PowerPoint into the documents. Uh, we can do that for sure, because I thought that everybody already has the PowerPoint. So I thought it would be easier just to give you this one slide and tell you the location of it. It's, it's uh, in the same format, what have you. It'll just be slide number three now or whatever the number is. Um, do you have a preference, Toby? I was just thinking for staff because I do have, like we have our our share file that we have to find quick reference, but that way it was already there. So they weren't having to remember, did I get the slide? I, I had assigned a few staff members to handle the online um, IRF portion um, and they alternate, but I just want to make sure that the materials are there where I don't have to go back in and try to get their thumb drives or the other file to update it myself. Okay, that sounds great. I'll work with my partner Sydney to do that. Okay. To get to also get that into the uh, TRI folders for you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any last uh, questions related to that discussion? And thank you, Ronnie and uh, Sydney, and also uh, Hannah and folks at TRI for getting this uh, more more virtual, more automated. So thank you much. Um, Joan, I see on the agenda, child care guidance at a glance for parents. Was that going to be any broader or any more in depth than what you already said? I don't really think so. I mean, Margie might have had a few other things to say, but I we don't really have anything else to say. We just launched the project yesterday. Um, so I would say we can come back and do some updates, but I think at this point it would be premature to really talk any more about it. Perfect. All right. And Shannon, you have a question? Yeah, this is just for or Joan or any of you. I'm working in the community, and this is off some other subjects, but it's um, in the community like Yam Hill and Polk, for example, the commissioners, um, have received funds and several of them are saying i'm going to focus on child care and let's see what they need and it's money that needs to be spent by i think december mm -hmm. and um so can you explain what what where that's coming from i mean i know it's it, do you know <laughs> I, I guess the the county or the city is going to uh get well, I'm, I mean, I would need some more details. I don't, I'm guessing that it has something to do with, so some of the funds that were provided to uh, states in the CARES Act were very time limited. So if I had to, you know, use my gut in this situation, my assumption is that some of these more time limited funds have been distributed at the like municipality level. Okay. So depending on whether this is a county government or city government or may, may have occurred for both. And so they've been given access to these funds to be able to address what I'm guessing are, you know, like probably a variety of needs, a list of things they can use it for. And so, um, 
I mean, to me, it seems like an opportunity because here you yeah. have people with funding and they need to understand how could I invest this money that's only good for a short period of time in ways that would be most helpful in my community. So, um, but if you have more specifics, Shannon, like, you know, was this a city or a county person and la la la, like I'll try to track back. Well, they did say it was from the CARES Act and, and it was from the county commissioners from okay. both counties. And they uh, they said they were given, you know, like you like you just said, uh, yeah. some money that has to be spent from the CARES Act and they're trying to figure it out. But, you know, these two counties are like, we want to focus on child care and child care needs so we can improve access. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're doing short surveys for them to figure out what providers want and need. And trying to steer them in ways where it can be sustainable and not, you know, so, well, we need we need to pay pay our providers. Well, what happens when December comes and you don't, you have to stop that, you know, if, if they're going to be hiring new people. So it, it's something that needs more materials or things like that. So we're, I want to make sure that I'm steering them in the right direction and in my thinking in that. Um, yes, I know providers should be paid and they need they need help but you know that that can't be sustained after this short-term money so right uh, i mean one possibility would be thinking you know again i'm just doing a little yeah. brainstorming you know there are maybe some things that would be helpful for people who are want needing to implement the new guidelines um for example let's say that they haven't made a move towards individualized materials for children. They still just have the kind of ways in which they were operating pre-COVID. Now they understand like, dang it, I'm gonna have to buy the individual tubs and I need a lot more of things than I did before. Or, you know, some things like that, you know, which are gonna be lasting, but are, you know, from talking to providers, I'm sure you all hear it too. I mean, people talk, about the expense of the daily activities and how you support that and you just need a lot more stuff for individual mm -hmm. children you've got to replace your play-doh a right. lot so i'm just using very specific examples to say like i i think i think if uh i think you could think about things like that i don't know if that would be a appeal to them you know sometimes people you know they want like you said they they want to get at the heart of the matter which of course we don't want to discourage but um it's hard to know how that would be sustained, as you said. So I yeah, I think it awesome. goes all over the place, and and yeah. especially when you have a committee together. And so we're trying to say, short term, you just you, these are things you just need to. Well, you know, let's do a need survey. You know, so sounds like I'm I'm sort of going in the right direction. I just mm -hmm. um, wasn't quite sure where this money was. <laughs> it sounds like they got to decide where they wanted to focus it. So. Yeah. Well, and, uh, think, and it sounds like possibly Karen uh, Hinkemeyer has uh, some additional information and maybe even Eva looks like she's raising her hand around uh, what they might be doing. Karen, do you want to say anything um, in preface to what your strategy is? I'd love to. Um, so I was lucky enough to be asked to sit on the work group to design the how we spend the money. And um, I really advocated for RF and CF providers because they have been working since day one um, and they are mostly those that are continuing to stay open compared to childcare centers. Originally, they wanted to support larger corporations and large centers and um, uh, the community listen and we will be awarding um, 9,999 9 or less to license exempt providers who have been providing child care for a year, RFs and CFs. And um, there's a lot of specifications around um, if they've had any other grant, how we still advocate for them to get this money. Um, and then also the community is looking at putting more millions of dollars into child care itself for sustainability because um, I've just been saying over and over, it's the only profession that makes all other professions possible. And the RFs and CFs are what 
are bringing us through this pandemic here, at least in Washington County. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Eva? Yeah, we have similar conversations happening in a couple of our counties. Um, Shannon, to your point, it does seem like there are some city municipalities that have money and some county municipalities that have money. So it, it seems like it's coming in different ways and um, for us is being designed in a little bit different ways. Um, my mantra, if there is one, as, as we've had these conversations, is that we need to look for the short term uh, gap, but without damaging the long term fragile system that we already um, support. Um, and so one of my counties is talking about uh, how can we provide some subsidies around um, providers that um, have been providing through COVID. Um, subsidies being more flexible for them that they can provide it out in terms uh, of scholarships to families or they could provide it as, as additional wages for teachers or supplies or cleaning. Um, I, I think I would like to invite a conversation for anybody that's having these conversations to kind of do a little bit of brainstorming together um, because I think we probably got a lot of different ideas and, and ways that we could um, share out with our communities. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that would be interesting about you all kind of maybe even getting some sense of like, are there any things that we should try to do across the whole state or is there any core of that is then that becomes a much more systemic strategy, even though it's funded by a lot of different places. It, 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 it treats the treats it like it's one coherent system. So I'm not saying that's the answer, but that's one thing that could emerge if you make that kind of choice. Karen Prow. I think in the system that I'm into, it's political. There's, you know, we've got the commissioners in there. Um, so they a lot of times have have their set mind on mm -hmm. sort of what they want to do. And you kind of have to rein them in and kind of <laughs> move them in a certain way. But because <laughs> uh, I know like mine, one of mine is like they don't want to do the just give them a, a, a flat amount of money. They want to do things. So uh, I know it's going to be different for everybody for sure. Yeah. So, well, just I'll say one quick thing and then I, I, I believe we have someone else that wants to talk is like sometimes it helps to get these folks to remember these are businesses. And so most small businesses don't want people to give them stuff. They want to be in on the decision making. And it's like, you validate the importance of this business owner's leadership of this business when they get to be involved in the decision versus when we just give them something. So I'm not saying you should try that, Shannon, just saying that has worked for me to just. Yeah, and luckily they, they've invited several types of providers in on this funding group that we're in. So that's really cool. I was. You know, but they were handpicked, <laughs> so I don't, you know, you know, I don't know how much they're intertwined, but um, yeah, well, that seems good. All right, uh, Karen Proud, did you have uh, something to add? Yeah, we just finished up an agreement. I think it's getting signed tomorrow with the city, and then we move on to the one with the county for the the CARES Act money that they're receiving. The one with the city, we were able to get really creative and come up with about six different options on how to fund providers through this. And it's everything from helping to do a stipend for um, practicum placement because of how that might look different. And we're trying to you know, keep up with our professional development with our COCC students. And then things like giving a $4,000 stipend to childcare centers that might have a classroom they're not using right now, just because of their numbers to be able to um, stand up some additional school age programming. So to be able to work with those programs and licensing is involved in this and um, their wages for their first month and then $1,000 to do whatever they might need to do to make that um, space more developmentally appropriate and i mean that's just a couple of them but um our city was willing to this is bend was willing to sit down and get really creative on 
even doing odd air odd hour care stipends um, that we could distribute and just looking at the workforce in the area and how is it being impacted by COVID. And then, so all of that work has really laid the foundation for Deschutes County now and Crook and Jefferson as well to look at those um, problem solving conversations to build what they're gonna do. So does that sustainable after December though? Well, it it's one of those things where we feel like the further we can get programs um, staying open, the better off we're going to be. The help to actually turn a classroom into school age care, as long as the pandemic keeps lockdowns on schools, that that's going to be necessary. And it is more likely to keep those programs open if they have a source of income. And so the, the only programs that would be doing that are programs that can't take more preschool children because there just aren't that many looking for care right now because families are choosing to keep their kids at home. So um, trying to have lots of options so that the business owners can choose what makes the most sense and what fits the best with how they would like to move forward with their business. And then the business coaching thing too, I was really surprised that the city wanted to help fund that but they saw a need for if we're going to throw federal or state dollars at providers and they're not accustomed to knowing how to spend those and how to do the documentation that they're less likely to get themselves into trouble and they're more likely to have a sustainable plan past december um, if they work with a coach so that's those are, I'm, I'm hearing lots of great ideas that uh, I think would be really important for us as a system to um, create some space for you guys to have that conversation uh, tangibly. And, and I think, as Joan said, in, in whatever ways makes sense to start to drive forward some systemic things that might transfer across the entire state in, in addition to some of the very unique things that you guys might be creating in partnership in your local areas, because obviously uh, you do have uh, some some opinions in those uh, municipalities as to what they want those uh, resources used for. And I, I, but I think the more that you're prepared with uh, some really great strategies like what have been talked about today, I think you guys can help maneuver those conversations appropriately. So is that something that you would like uh, the division to schedule uh, an opportunity for you guys to have that further discussion? Or is that uh, something that you would, uh, I see Jerry with a thumbs up on uh, us scheduling that, Heather Heather's saying uh, something similar. I see. A I say yes, but it has to be like soon because I know they're trying to get their decisions made probably within the next two weeks because um, they want to get this money spent. Um, so, I mean, I, the, at least in my my side of the world, they're looking for it pretty quick. Okay. Decisions made. Within the next week, uh, reasonable? If we try and gather you all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll look for some time uh, to get a conversation together to continue what uh, what was not on the agenda today. Uh, but thank you, Shannon, because it was no this this was uh, one of those kind of emergent things that I think is uh, critical for us as a system to be thinking through. Um, and and clearly, some movement has occurred in various areas. So. Um, we'll we'll get a further conversation uh, scheduled so you guys can continue to share. So thanks for bringing that one forward. All right, looking at our agenda um, uh, again. This uh, the next the next agenda item is specifically related to Wonder School, but I I broadened it a little bit because I think um, there's been a few things that have have occurred over a period of months. There were uh, several regions that were sort of poised to listen in to a proposal that Wonder School had uh, related to helping um, create shared services spaces uh, in our system. And so really thinking about how groups of child care providers, and especially at the time, family child care providers could benefit from um, administrative supports, back-end uh, uh, 
resources to help them run their businesses. And, um, and so I think, uh, interestingly, you know, we, we've had a region, um, which is our Coos and Curry region that, uh, was sort of the first to, uh, jump into that, um, uh, relationship with uh, Wonder School, and I think that uh, Tay will probably be able to give us a little bit more information. But it sounds as if in just recent weeks that maybe some of our other regions that may or may not have been in on those initial conversations might also be entertaining some um, uh, some partnership possibilities with Wonder School. And so I wanted to be able to kind of open this up. But it also sounds like Wonder School may be doing some. Uh, one-off connections with with regions on their own and so i think this is another one of those areas where the more that we can think through strategies um system-wide the better and so um i have something here in a slide that sort of relates so give me a second while i uh change this over so one of the things that i was thinking about because i i think you know, Wonder School School is one um, one entity that is sort of a child care uh, management system. They have software, they have tools. They they you know they're a provider of that kind of service. Um, we're embarking on uh, sort of reinitiating our strategies around uh, getting business training into communities. And so I think time-wise, along with all of the um, uh, systems issues and the stressors that are occurring for childcare programs, I think we're at this really important time frame where we can start to connect some dots. And so I think we've got a strategy around business practices training, and uh, you'll all be um, receiving the training of trainers application so you can get staff that you'd like uh, to be considered to attend that training, uh, the training series in October signed up for that. So that'll be coming out in the next, it might come out today, but uh, definitely this week. And um, I think the important part to note as, as we've been thinking about um, business training. Business training is great. It's important if it's at a period of time where it makes most sense for uh, that provider to hear that information, like during tax season or whatever. Sometimes that information sinks in and they're able to utilize it. But as we know, in, in all cases with any kind of professional development training, um, if it's not reinforced almost immediately or usable in small bites, um, the provider, in this case, uh, as the recipient of that information, loses uh, the information. The forgetting curve, uh, most of you are familiar with uh, concepts like this, but uh, within a seven-day period of time, if they're not immediately relating it to something that is um, uh, usable or reinforcing it with uh, examples that relate directly to their business, they lose almost 95, 90 to 95% of that information in uh in a few weeks. And so um, this one's showing that within seven days, they can pretty much lose everything that you've told them. So that, that goes for professional development in general, but when these folks are really more uh, specifically engaged with children around uh, pedagogical learning, um, this business concept and some of the strategies around budgeting and supporting them uh, widely beyond that are foreign concepts. Um, and so, I think the more that we can embed what we're doing uh, directly into practice, the better. And so, um, when we're thinking about you know what works best, you guys you guys already know. I mean the the training is great. Some individualized consultation after the fact is even better. Um, but the concept that we really are needing to um, create additional strategies around is how to how to partner up good professional development and training and consultation with the technological advancements that we have at our fingertips. So this child care management software idea really needs to be um, ingrained or in integrated into um, these conversations that we're having with child care providers and really supporting them in, in the administrative function and un understanding how they can best um, 
decrease their workload on those aspects so they can increase their focus on what they do best, which is working with kids. And so I really wanted to frame this up in a, in a specific way, not to be a marketer for um, Wonder School, because I think there's plenty of strategies out there that are child care management software type uh, opportunities. But um, I think there's a few things that Wonder School offers that are worth at least um, CCRNRs that are thinking about embedding some, some of these things in. And uh, I think it's important for you to think through some of those uh, potential differences. And so, hold on just a second. What I noticed is I lost all of you on the camera. So I'm going to pause just for a second uh, to make sure I didn't lose anybody or if anybody's been waving their hands at me wildly because they didn't like what I was saying, or they were sleeping like uh, the folks who don't have their camera on. Okay, no, everybody looks okay. All right, so um, this whole software component, I think, is is important. Some of the things that we were doing early on with our Baby Promise partnerships was really trying to think about how can we strengthen what is available to those providers that are sort of in this network. I think networks are a very strong way to start thinking through how you can add those resources to the mix. Um, but I think there's other ways to create just networks around sort of the, the background uh, supports and administrative supports too. But I, I think the Focus Child Care Network component is really a strong place to start to embed these things. But if you're if you're working with providers, also you take you take one of those products off the shelf and you give them a an automation tool, um, and you help them get it all set up on their computers and you get them up and going. But if they don't have sort of ongoing connection um, around how to use that tool and when to use that tool, um, that it may sit there just as 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 much as the business curriculum that you've presented to them, they may not be utilizing it as effectively. And so I think the interesting part about Wonder School, um, and this is sort of the last part that I'll say around this, is there's some, it, it's I when they came in and did their presentation to a few CCRNRs a few months ago, it's been maybe several months ago. Uh, some of what it came across like was that it was a it was really a marketing strategy for providers to get their slots filled, and that is just actually just one of the things that uh, Wonder School offers. And so I think the interesting parts, and so what I highlighted here in green on this slide, which may be pretty small for you guys to read, but the green stuff is sort of what to me feels a little bit in addition to that, that Wonder School provides that's different than just a child care management software. And the piece that I think is critical is, you know, they do this, parents can sign up online, you know, and enroll in these programs online. So there's an automation around that. So it's a real simple application process. It can be tailored. They do electronic billing, which is just like any other child care management software, but it can be done ACH or credit card options. They do the invoicing, but the, the difference is they do the late fee. Uh, they can follow up on, on when payments aren't made, if it's not uh, automated fully or the parent ends their payments. They actually are able to follow up on the delinquent payments and they do the legwork for the providers on that. And I think that's in addition to because child care management software doesn't, you know, it's just a software. It's just a it's just a thing that's that's available. But this is more of a service. And so um, they also work on helping providers set the right um, uh, uh, cost per child you know, in their region for what it can support in the market. They help them again with the marketing components. They help with um, fiscal and earning strategies so that they're getting, you know, it's the, anybody who's listened to Louise Stoney around um, shared services and the iron triangle, uh, what they're truly working with providers to do is ensure that they get paid every cent that they're owed, that they're uh, fully, uh, enrolled that they have full enrollment as much as feasibly possible so that they're not losing income in in their budgets that they put together because if you're lower enrolled than than uh what you initially prepared that budget around um you're not earning the amount of income that uh that you had initially 
expected. And then the other piece is, is ensuring that the market can bear uh, the rate that they're hoping to charge. So that's sort of what the iron triangle is. So anyway, those are some of the components that are different. I think what I had heard and Shannon was the one who had requested that maybe we have a bit of a conversation around this. Um, I am not at all pushing that Wonder School should be what uh, entities in our state uh, select as a way to support child care providers administratively, but I am saying that uh, I think that you should all be considering what ways you can do some back-end supports for child care providers administratively, and Wonder School is one of those options. Um, if there is an interest, and then I'm going to kind of pause and let Taya and others who've been maybe potentially talking more with Wonder School about this. If there's an interest in having them do a bit of a presentation, you know, no um, no requirement for any regions to kind of jump on board with this, but if there's regions that are interested, because I think the timing that we're in right now with Preschool Promise uh, slots hitting regions, and again, just thinking of all the ways that we're going to have network activity occurring for providers, maybe this is an option to kind of couple with those strategies that you're working on. And so if you want them to do a presentation, we can arrange that. Um, but at this point, I'm going to pause for a second. And uh, I know that there's probably been a lot of back uh, back end activity going on um, with, uh, I know Multnomah has been uh, chatting with uh, Wonder School and uh, and then of course Coos and Curry. So Taya, why don't you kick it off and then we'll see uh, what else is going on and then if we want to proceed with any other strategies. Sure. Um, you know, we spent about, oh, six or nine months looking at different uh, software, really doing demos of ProCare and, you know, just all of them. And um, we inherited from Louise Stoney, who are working with spreadsheets of, you know, which program provides what, and we were just really drowning in choice, it felt like. Um, they're all good. They all offer slightly different things. None of them are really perfect for both RF and, and CFNCC programs. Um, and we had kind of glanced at Wonder School, and it's really pretty and shiny, and we actually kind of wrote it off as like, oh, they're all about the marketing and that's not what we need. Our programs are all full of the time. People here don't really look online to find programs. It's not our thing. But then Louise really, Louise Denny really encouraged us to look again. Um, and what we, I think what John said that really uh, resonated with our experience was that it is a service um, more than it's a software program. And the other software that we looked at felt pretty one size fits all. Um, and, you know, things like if a program uh, wanted to adjust their billing, uh, something to do with their billing, they wanted to charge a lower rate um, for a month to a family because the family was experiencing hardship or there was some kind of um, special circumstances. Most software doesn't handle that very well. Um, and Wonder School is always there. There's always humans there to, um, work with the program to adjust um, adjust the, the program in the software program in whatever ways work for the providers. So that seemed really, really important to us. Um, at the same time, they offer, that, they offer that business coaching to say, hey, maybe you shouldn't adjust these rates down um, because look at how this is gonna impact you. Here's some best practices, best business practices, et cetera. So, um, I think one of the things that we really responded to from the beginning is that when we met, when we were looking at, say, uh, you know, another, any other software system, we had a rep come and just demo it for us. And with Wonder School, we've been meeting with the CEO regularly. We've been meeting with um, their software designers. We've been meeting with their whole team, depending on what we're talking about. And they're asking a lot of questions to us as they continue to build their product so that it meets the needs of rural providers and meets the needs of centers, because it did start out as a family care um, system. Um, and so we felt like we are really authentically partnering with Wonder School um, for them to continue to refine the services that they offer. Um, and that's felt really, it's really pretty cool. You know, we feel supported in our shared services project beyond just having them provide a few services to the providers. It feels like 
we're working together. They've also created um, a community space for the uh, leaders of shared services alliances across the country that they're working with. So we're in communication with those other people who are running alliances around the country um, and learning from them. So it feels like they're working towards supporting shared services as opposed to providing some billing support, right? It feels really holistic and, and uh, pretty powerful and we really like them. They're really fun to work with and that they're very human and really creative and dynamic. So that's my slide <laughs> of why Wonder School. That's a good, uh, a good, Intro, thanks. And so I see uh, Christine and Jerry uh, with their hands raised. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I agree with Taya. I will say I was probably one of the biggest skeptics when they first came around. Um, I really felt like it was all about marketing and it felt like every other system. Um, and they have proven me wrong time and time again. Um, I'll echo what Taya said about meeting with the CEO and um, we're meeting with them in a few different capacities right now, all still very much in the exploratory phases, um, but it really is a partnership. So we're looking at it from the standpoint of um, our universal preschool program with the county going forward. And they are partnering with us talking about how they could create a system that's well beyond what they're doing now that would actually coordinate enrollment for a countywide program, but would also service providers with like admin views and different levels of security and different levels of view for different users. So that's a completely separate development piece that we're a project that we're working on and they have their teams in there and nothing has been signed. There's no money, they have no money from us yet and they are still having those conversations with us. We're also talking with them about um, how it might look in a smaller pilot, whether it's going to be Baby Promise, Baby Promise and our CCI program or other networks. Um, and the really cool thing that they have finally committed to is that they will work with us on translations. So one of my biggest things was I didn't feel like it was a product for our prioritized populations in our county. And they are willing to work on having it function in different languages, um, for different sites programs, starting that business coaching at a very different level than what they were used to doing. And so they are willing to partner. Um, I will reiterate what John says, there are other people, there are other programs. Um, and so I'm not, again, I'm also not doing a commercial because I still have my um, reservations and I still have pieces, but they are good partners and they do offer a lot and they are outside the box thinkers. And it feels like since COVID, my personal opinion has been that they are more willing to explore different options and think outside the box for their own business. So that's been really positive. So a couple of questions I see, Jerry and Eva, but I did want to answer one uh, that Karen had around cost. And if uh, Taya, can you remind me, it's either 125 or 150 per month per provider. Isn't that where they're at right now? So it's 150 per month um, for family care providers. Um, and then centers, they, they kind of don't quite have that worked out yet because they're only just starting to build their product for centers. So for us, they actually, we kind of bartered with them and they agreed to um, provide service for the centers and our alliance for free for a year because they don't have everything built that those centers will need. And then we're going to be, uh, you know, offering back our feedback about um, what, the, what they're doing and how it is supportive to centers. So um, I don't think they have a firm pricing model for centers yet, um, but we are hoping to, <laughs> that it, um, you know, through alliances, there will be opportunities to, to bring those costs down below that $150 mark. Um, and although we haven't talked about the ongoing cost, Louise has spoken, uh, Louise believes that that cost is gonna come down in time. So, okay. but they were willing to work with us on costs is my point. Excellent, all right. So, um, so Taya, um, the programs that you have that are using it, the home-based providers, 
are they part of um, your pre your baby promise program, or are I mean, how are you using it right now with your what mm -hmm. with what providers? So we have a, a separate grant um, to provide a shared services alliance, and our shared services alliance is made up of partially our baby promise providers, um, and and partly um, other providers from our community who are interested in joining shared services. So we've got some of both. It's, um, you know, small, about 10 providers. Um, and we're, but we're still signing people up. So we have a little core group, but it's building out. Um, and we haven't, we're just in the beginning phases with Wonder School. We've spent a lot of time negotiating our relationship with Wonder School. And so we're just getting our providers signed up now. So I don't really have feedback from providers about their feelings about Wonder School, only my own feelings and you know the rest of the, the those of us who are um, administrating the project. And so do you actually have providers um, in your group that are paying for the costs themselves or uh, are all of the providers participating right now are having it being paid through your um, your grant? Yeah, we're paying for it um, through our grant um, a year fully and then stepping down the supports. And then really, you know, Wonder School also understands that um, if they don't see increased revenue and cost savings that make up that $150 a month, then they're not going to stick with it over time. So that's the um, that's the expectation. I guess um, is that uh, as Wonder and Wonder School is big on data. They have a whole lot of backend data for us, and so they're going to be tracking um, how much more income is coming into this program. What are they saving in terms of, um, you know, maybe staff time for administration, et cetera. And then if over the course of of our subsidizing it, hopefully we'll see you know see that that hundred dollars go makes a difference to the program. And so they're not actually losing money to bring it to use Wonder School. Okay, thank you. And so I saw Eva and then Shannon, and then I do wanna seal this up as uh, essentially this was a, a, an intro to see if we wanted to hear more um, and to potentially schedule a conversation where Wonder School can chat with other regions that might wanna at least hear what uh, they're working on. Uh, but if you have just questions before you're trying to decide whether you even want to get to that place, uh, let's let's start with that stuff. So Eva and Shannon. Yeah, I, I think, um, John, thank you for that, because I would say yes, I want to hear more. Um, I and and maybe I'm I'm missing some things here, but I listened to Christine talk and Taya and and my mind goes to um, what are are there possibilities with Wonder School um, that we could engage in with our hubs around coordinated enrollment? Um, so kind of looking at a, at a bigger group um, and then also trying to think about how um, working with Wonder School in partnership with the hub or not or with providers, how that connects back to 211 um, and referrals back into programs. And so kind of wanting to take a, a step up, I guess, and look at from a higher level at, at what can can be put together in a in a larger system type approach. So I would love to hear more. Yeah, and Christine, I know that your hub is uh, integrally involved in those conversations. And Taya, I don't know if you, uh, if your hub is also, um, no, but. That's a no from me, but I know that um, Wonder School is really interested in like systems level supports. So I think that they would be really, really interested in whatever, like looking at coordinated enrollment and so forth, but um, we're not going that direction right now. Yeah, I, I agree that if we, uh, if we are going to have a presentation, we want the hubs involved in uh, hearing what it is. I also think with our transition from NACRAWARE to uh, Fine Child Care Oregon, there is a piece of this where all this needs to integrate together. Wonder School has a front end to their system and sort of that marketing component and a you know, website and providers 
get coached on how to utilize all those materials and and uh, put themselves out there. But we wanted to integrate it into our our system too. And we we've talked a little bit about that. So they could either have links to and from both sides, um, but that essentially there'd be no wrong door for providers to hit or for parents to hit uh, the provider and see, you know, where uh, and what types of services they offer and, and all of that kind of stuff. But we'd want to work that stuff out. Definitely. Um, Shannon, I think was next on our list. It was just basically on how it's paid for. And I, that was answered. I just, you know, as I look at it, I don't know how that would work without an, a grant. It'd be something you'd have to get a grant for if you're going to pay for it. Have, has anybody just asked providers, would they pay for it? I mean, if we brought it forward to, let's say a network, um, I, you know, I don't know, maybe you pay half of it and they pay the other half, but um, just trying to think of ways that could help well, the cost. Cause, yeah, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, there, there's probably a lot of supports coming from the Wonder School side on how to make that pitch to providers. They've successfully created groups of providers that have, you know, from the get-go paid for this service from the get-go, we're skeptical about whether or not they were going to see a return on their investment. And um, folks that are are continuing to do it, and it's it. Shared Services Alliances have gone both directions. I think Louise Stoney um, would suggest that you want to build it in from the start, even if they're paying just a tiny bit, um, and then slowly, as they're seeing value, you know, get to that full amount. But I think that's all. You know, that's that's jumping way far ahead. I think there's a lot to just understand about whether or not regions think that this is even a viable thing um, that they want to pursue and um, and you know what other options you might have but uh, Karen Prow I think you had a question yeah so back one of the very first times that I remember having conversations with Wonder School and I don't know if it was through the Pritzker shared services grant or when it was but there was a conversation about if Oregon jumped into a Wonder School relationship, could we have that be something where it was matched up with Spark and the quality improvement work that the CCRNR system was already doing? That could we get a lower price for providers because um, Wonder School offers that um, curriculum and other coaching around the quality of a program? And so I wonder if we were to come back as a state and have a conversation with all the RNRs in the hub, um, is that something that we could talk about in the very beginning to potentially get that overall cost down for all of our providers in the state? I know a wonder school has talked to us about how they are doing more of that work with different states and they're they on their end are very interested in doing looking at that bigger level and talking but i mean that would depend on how oregon feels about that well i think if we're going to be doing the work anyway and if it's going to become that partnership then why not take advantage of that to get the cost down instead of just going to it at the same rate that other states do but they're not having to do that quality work. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a fair question, Karen, and um, something I think we'd all be interested in discussing a little bit further. Um, so just looking at our time, and we do have one more agenda item here uh, with Preschool Promise and uh, Dana and Andy, um, who, graciously waited till the very end today um if so it sounds like there's a little bit of interest in hearing more um we can schedule a uh conversation so more regions can um engage with uh wonder school around the sort of general proposal and then we can dive in a little bit deeper around how all these things fit together i think i'd like to invite um uh hub partners um, that are interested in hearing it uh, as they're thinking about things that uh, uh, relate to preschool promise, and um, and then we'll we'll see how that goes. But uh, 
uh, I do. It looks like Paula has a, a conversation coming up with them. Does anybody else have scheduled conversations coming up with Wonder School? Doesn't look. I like don't it. yet, but I'm thinking about it. But if we're going to just have one, then I'll hold off. Okay. And Mary. And John, um, I've heard from Heidi McGowan that they're doing um, or planning some pilots around shared services. How does this fit in with that? Um, so uh, curiously, I'm not sure if there's uh, there may be more activity going on that Heidi has been engaged in um, than I'm aware, but I, I do know that uh, her she has worked with and supported uh, what is going on in the Coos and Curry area. And, um, and they have, you know, sort of created in partnership with Taya and their team, the, the shared services model that they're, they're working towards. So that is definitely sort of one of the pilots that exists out there. Um, I'm not sure if Heidi's working on some other strategies um, as part of the Oregon, um, the child care provider relief guide, or if there's, some things that went on there, but um, we can always loop back around to her to find out more unless Taya has or uh, Leslie has some additional thoughts about what that might be. I think that there's some interest from philanthropy in supporting some shared service efforts across the state and that that's still developing and that Haiti is sort of working on a coordinated effort there with some foundations. Okay. So we're, I'm actually meeting with Heidi and Jill later, and so I, I definitely think she should be part of a or invited to the conversation too. Okay. So John, she's developing a a development team for shared services with a few regions. Um, is kind of what's happening, and there is seed money from a foundation. Okay. All right. We can definitely connect the dots there too. Um, just jotting down some notes. I'm also wondering if somehow some of the strategies that might be uh, in these local municipality conversations might coincide with some of this too. I mean, if funding can go to support the administrative function of programs and pay for it up front. Um, you know, that could be a possibility too. Okay, so uh, was there any last questions about this? Um, I am going to give the last eight whole minutes to uh, uh, Preschool Promise related to some of the correspondence that has gone out and maybe even uh, information about what is planned to go out to our uh, intent to awardees for Preschool Promise. So uh, Dana and Andy, are you still with us? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, no, this is great. Thank you for inviting us. And I don't even think we're going to take the full eight minutes. Uh, so there should be lots of time for any questions or for uh, starting a lunch break a little early. Um, so I guess the update that we have to offer around communication is that um, there is a letter that is slated to go out today to the tier one and tier two intent to awardees uh, and that letter is just a, a friendly little hey here's what's going on here's what to expect um, and we can get you a copy of that letter too once it goes out uh, and it really just says you'll be getting your grants uh, our aim is to get grants out this month um, that is still our aim um, we, we have folks who are working very diligently uh, to make that happen. There's a lot of stuff on the back end with DocuSign that is part of that work too. So um, there are some added layers there that, that we um, weren't planning for in February, but we're happy to do now so that people can feel that they can review all the materials electronically uh, and respond and uh, sign all materials electronically. So um, those will be going out this month, um, the grant. And then uh, in the letter, it also outlines that uh, the CCRNRs are getting set up to offer TA and that um, once they finalize their grant, we'll be able to connect them with you guys uh, and also information around um, coordinated enrollment through the hub. 
and that the hubs are responsible for recruitment and eligibility. And I think that it's important for us to note that in the letter, we are trying to be very clear that programs should not be enrolling children without um, going through their hubs or speaking with their hubs, um, that hubs are responsible for determining the eligibility of children. And we know that we have some people who have already moved ahead to that step and um, will be communicating uh, as we know them with them to help problem solve that. The intention there is really to make sure that we are, um, the programs are enrolling families who do qualify. We don't want any family to enroll in a program and then uh, maybe not be able to stay in that program. Uh, and, and so we just want to make sure that we're getting everybody the best information possible on that. Um, so that letter should be going out today. The grant should be going out this month. This month ends on Monday. So fingers crossed. Uh, and after that, then uh, we should start hearing responses back from folks. Uh, and again, they, they do technically have 90 days to respond. I suspect what we'll see is a lot of people respond very quickly and some other people who need to take a little bit more time to think about um, how they're planning their services this fall and if it's still a fit for them, given that the RFAs uh, were mostly written back in a February, March timeframe. Um, we have already had a couple who, who are still thinking about what they're really able to do this year. Um, along with the grant, there is a piece in the appendix which outlines different delivery options that people can think about. For Preschool Promise, technically it's a waiver because it needs to be a waiver process from the program requirements. Uh, and so that's outlined in the grant as well in the appendix. And once we release those, we can get you a copy of that as well. And it really just outlines a couple of different options, whether it is fully remote, which we're calling comprehensive home-based learning because it's learning happening in the child's home. If there's a hybrid version, whether that is um, a certain set of children who are on site every day and a certain set of children who are not on site every day, or if there is some sort of rotating schedule, a staggering schedule for two groups of children. And then we're also giving them an option to tell us if they've designed something that works for them locally that is different from any of those three options. Uh, and then within the reporting form, there's some specific questions for them to demonstrate how they'll be meeting preschool promise requirements or which preschool promise requirements they may be requesting a waiver for. For example, the 900 hours. Some folks may be requesting a waiver for that at this point, and we understand that. And so that's the option for them. I'm going to say really quickly, there's a man on a ladder with a leaf blower outside my office. So if it gets loud, I'm going to ask Dana to take over. Sorry about that. Um, so I, those are the contract grant uh, appendix that will be going out around delivery options. We'll be working with providers around what they're capable of doing this year and what they're able to do this year knowing that there will be some differences while we're still in the state of emergency um, and, a, and a health crisis. Um, I think those are mostly the communication updates. We're putting together um, a supplementary document to go with the grants uh, to help people think through their delivery decisions and the implementation of that. So a, a resource guide, um, if you will, to go with that. And so working on that currently to get out. Um, it needs to be separate from the grant, uh, but it will be help them, I think, as a planning guide for thinking about implementation this, um, at least this coming fall. Who knows, maybe a little longer than that. Um, Dana, is there anything you wanted to add? No, you cover everything, thank you. I saw at one point uh, Heather had a question I have a couple of questions just real quick. So in the grant that they're going to receive, are they going to, are all the guidelines in that grant? Has the guidance? Yeah. Okay. And then um, the coordinated enrollment um, trainees that were available, I just had millions of meetings, so I didn't, couldn't attend. Is that somewhere where it's recorded and I could go watch that later? Yes, yeah, they are recorded and I can, and unless Dana knows off the top of her head, um, I could find it for you and get it to you. Yeah, we can go ahead and connect with Anne and she can go ahead and make the links available. So, yeah. Okay. All right. That's what I had. Mary and, Mary? Then, and then Karen. Uh, we are planning our first meeting with our preschool province providers um, Wednesday. And um, 
we'd certainly like to see the letter before that. But I'm also wondering, is there any chance that um, you or Dana would be able to attend and uh, they could hear from uh, the people that are really in charge? Uh, that's a little tricky for us um, just because they're not our grantees yet until they have their contract and they're signed. Um, so we may be able to attend, but we may not be able to say much more than what is already in the letter. Um, Dana, I don't know if, if you feel like you could take a, a different approach. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, I mean, we're always here to go ahead and support as much as we can. Um, I know our grants team is also getting ready. You know, we, we're having like two people from our grants team who's, who are really our grant managers who are also available to answer questions. So I'll go ahead and pass this on. We want to be supported to you all. I will say like that, you know, the best thing to do right now is connect them to to us directly. Like if they have questions, uh, I know for many programs require a lot of uh, just different TA, but if we can get back to you on that, I think it's a little bit tricky, like Andy says, because they we're barely sending out the contracts, so they're not um, not really like a preschool promise provider. So, yeah, let so us do some more internal uh, internal um, you know thinking on that on how to how to best support all of you guys as you guys move forward with this. Let's see so, up. would you suggest it might be better to you know send what we were planning to send them? and then perhaps have a meeting where somebody could attend from ELD after they have received their letters, their grants? Great question. So what I'm gonna do is let me go ahead and, uh, cause we have different teams right now working on Preschool Promise. Let me go ahead and connect with our grants team, right? Um, cause I think they play a pretty intricate role as they're gonna be the ones monitoring like the contracts as they're getting signed. Um, so let me, if we can get back to you on that, I, and I can connect with you, Mary. Um, I know you, you've done lots of engagement and stuff, so we want to be supportive. So I just want to make sure that all the pieces kind of fall together and also our capabilities too. Uh, you know, Dana, she loves the road shows. I love visiting across the state, but then I, we also have to be, you know, a little bit mindful that then we don't have a bunch of meetings that then we're not able to accommodate. I think that will be my my biggest um my biggest concern there but let me go ahead and talk to our grants team and say like what are how do we work together as you guys are meeting with providers uh, what are some of the meetings that could potentially be held for providers here at the eld and how all that kind of comes together so i'll go ahead and connect with you okay thank you mm -hmm. and so we're uh slightly over time but i know taya and karen hinkemeyer had a quick question go ahead and see if we can get through them I have two questions. One, um, is it uh, once the contracts are complete with the sites, I'm really hoping that as a best practice, we can have combined meetings to show a collaboration on the effort. Um, I think that that's something that would be really great. And then number two is, what about our contracts? Are we waiting until October to get contracts for funding for hiring, or is it is something coming on by Monday for us too? So I'll take a first uh, glance at that one. You're talking about the funding that's coming to CCRNRs to support TA and professional development of the preschool promise programs. So um, we actually uh, are moving it as moving it forward as fast as we possibly can. I think what I can tell you around this is that. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of levers to pull from different angles, and uh, there was a point where we were unsure if we had uh, the ability to grant a portion of the funding yet, because there was uh, potentially a need to to visit with uh, legislative fiscal office a little bit further around that, and whether or not it needed some legislative authority. And so I think they've got that worked out. Um, your your budgets have um, uh, changed rapidly in the last week or so, uh, going up and down uh, multiple times. But I think we're we're solid now, and we have the authority for what we're planning to grant. But I, I the only reason I say all that is is that it uh, uh, it's moving it's a moving target, and it's been really really quick. And uh, um, 
it's been something that we've been uh, focused quite a bit of our time on, and uh, it should be hitting ODE procurement to go through that process, but that's going to take us a little while too. So um, do we want it to coincide with October? Absolutely. Um, and so we're, we're doing, doing everything we can. Um, and it's, it's still on the way and it's still, uh, I think on target for what we had originally thought we were, uh, granting to programs. So, uh, no, not that you know what those, uh, amounts are yet, but I think as soon as we get this into the hands of, uh, ODE procurement, we'll be able to, um, uh, what we would like to be able to do is bring it back to have a, individual conversations with each region to just at least give you a an idea of what we think the amount of funding would be. Um, there won't be an intent to award or or some um, actual documentation that's provided to you, uh, but at least we'll be able to give you um, uh, some some information on the amount of money that should be coming your way so you can start to think about what that means to you and your region. Um, and that at this point will be the best that we'll be able to do. And I'm hoping that that can be within the next couple of weeks that we can alert you to some of that information. But uh, um, that is somewhat dependent on uh, how ODE feels about how we've lumped uh, the CCR and our amendment uh, together with several funding sources coming into one uh, one amendment. So um, I know that sounds nebulous. I know that means a little bit of nothing to you right now, but I, I think the timeline to, to consider is hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have uh, some more tangible amounts of money to share just so you know what's coming your way. And so um, six minutes over. Taya Noland, I think you had a question. Is it still there? Uh, yeah, it's fast and small, and it is just whether any uh, programs that were tier two programs have been moved up and awarded and been given an attempt to award, uh, or if it's all still, all the programs are still in the tier they started off in. That's a, that's a great uh, question. Oh, sorry, Andy. Do I go through? <laughs> um, that's a great question. So all of our tier two have been moved to tier one so everything has been fully funded yay um because it happened so fast putting a disclaimer out there what they received was uh, about a week ago they they an, ended up getting like the that uh continuous quality like the startup survey so those tier two actually got an email that say Hey, Taya, guess what? We have more funding. We want to select you. Tell us what your startup. So I do want to go ahead and put the little disclaimer that the communication was pretty fast. Um, they We moved them fast. So I think the most formal communication is going to be, you know, like, as Andy said, it, during that, uh, when we send out the contract where they have it, but um, everything, everybody was moved up to tier one, I guess, fully funded. That is so exciting. And is there a place where we can look to see the updated intended awardees? Um, the only, we don't have like a, a new list. I think the only list that you guys can use will be just a general intent to award list. So if anybody that was on tier two, now you know that they are fully funded. Thank you. All right, so um, if, if, anyone has additional questions that uh, didn't we didn't get a chance to answer around preschool promise today well I, I know you have additional questions but ones that were sort of hot off the press for andy or dana if you don't have their contact information you can email me and um i'll get uh that to them if you do have their contact information it's a free-for-all feel free to hit them with as many questions as you might have um they will love to answer them all um, especially the ones that they don't have answers for they'll they'll definitely They'll definitely figure those out for you. Um, so here we are, 1208. Thanks everybody for a little bit of an extended meeting. Much appreciate uh, the engagement today. And uh, we do have some follow-up items to get a few uh, conversations together. Uh, so you guys can continue to share some strategies in your communities. So um, we'll work towards that and have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Take care.